again, we've got a number of different food sources and food possibilities here. Let's, let's go back to what causes vitamin K deficiency. I kind of took a, a, a kind of a turn off there earlier or a minute ago uh, when we were talking about blood thinning, but I want to talk about some of the causes. Now, one of the things that, that will cause a vitamin K deficiency is just a poor diet, a highly processed food diet. So if you're not getting in these rich greens or if the types of animal products that you're eating are feedlot animals, you're not going to get as rich of a source of vitamin K from that type of food. So an inadequate, highly processed food diet, not a good idea. If you have pre-existing inflammatory bowel disease, this can also create or set you up for vitamin K deficiency, more specifically because that inflamed bowel is damaged and we'll see most of the time people with inflamed bowel and inflammatory bowel disorders have bacterial problems in their GI tract. So you've got two problems there. You've got one where you might have a, a bacterial imbalance that's leading to an, a poor conversion of K1 to K2, but you also have damage to the intestinal lining, which again can manifest as not absorbing vitamin K adequately or not an, absorbing enough of that vitamin K that you're eating. So inflammatory bowel disease is a big part of this. The other thing that we might see, and let me make a little bit more room, is liver disease. So if you've got a history of hepatitis, for example, uh, or a biliary problem, any of you that have had your gallbladder removed, and that's pretty common surgery nowadays, um, you know, doctors kind of take out gallbladders the way they used to take out appendixes. Um, they would just tell you it's an old uh, organ, you don't really need it, let's just remove it so that your symptoms go away. Bad idea. Removing the gallbladder is a terrible idea unless it's acutely infected and threatening your life. You need your gallbladder. Remember earlier I said that vitamin K is fat soluble. And so what does that mean? It means that you, you need to absorb it. You need to be able to bind it or emulsify it with bile. Your gallbladder produces, or doesn't produce, your liver produces bile, but your gallbladder secretes the bile into your small intestine. And then the bile salts, what they do is they bind or they emulsify vitamin K. And when they do that, it turns vitamin K into a water-soluble subst substance that can now be properly absorbed across the intestinal lining. So in essence, you've got to have a functioning gallbladder. You've got to have a healthy liver to be able to properly secrete the bile acids to emulsify that vitamin K for the proper absorption. If you don't have a gallbladder, this process becomes hindered. If you have a hepatitis problem where you're not properly producing bile, this process can also be hindered. If you have a history of gallstones where you have stones that precipitate out into your gallbladder, this can inhibit your possibility at absorbing properly vitamin K. If you have, um, again, if you have a problem with your liver or your gallbladder, it can cause as a secondary side effect vitamin K deficiency. So it's smart if your vitamin K levels, if your doctor runs them and they come back low, it's smart to ask, is my liver functioning well? Do I need to run some liver function tests to determine whether or not I have a problem with my liver? So there are a number of different liver function tests in that regard. They, you, you know, very commonly doctors will run. One of them is called AST, another is called ALT. There's another test that measures something called bilirubin. These are very, very common blood tests that doctors will measure to get a general idea of whether or not your liver function is compromised. And so if you are, again, struggling with a gallbladder issue, these are some tests that are very, pretty simple. Most doctors can do insurance will cover these types of tests to help you determine whether or not your liver is functioning. Because if your liver's not functioning, likelihood that you're not adequately producing bile means that you're going to malabsorb vitamin K. Now, you'll also malabsorb vitamin A, D, and E, as well as omega-3. Because remember, bile acids are necessary for fat absorption. So no matter what fat it is that you're eating, whether those fats are vitamins or whether they, that fat is just the macronutrient fat itself that your body's trying to absorb. So if you've got a biliary problem, which is basically gallbladder disease, biliary problem or a gallbladder removal, or if you've had uh, uh, gallstones, or if you've got hepatitis, you're at risk for the potential for vitamin K deficiency. Now, another thing that can cause 
vitamin K deficiency. Let me box this out for you. Is in a nutshell is dysbiosis. Now, dysbiosis is referring to abnormal bacteria or an imbalance in the bacteria that live in your GI tract. So remember what I said earlier, these bacteria, it's thought that the good bacteria in your gut produce about 50% of your daily vitamin K. That's quite a bit, 50%. So again, if you're eating lots of greens, um, and, and, and those greens are, as they're coming in, your bacteria will convert a lot of those to K2 and, and create a lot of vitamin K for you for absorption. So again, part of your vitamin K is, is brought in through green leafies. The other part is actually produced by your good bacteria. So if you're, uh, if you're struggling with chronic conditions like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this is a form of dysbiosis. Or if you have low levels of, of healthy beneficial flora like lactobacillus or bifidobacteria, those things can contribute to a vitamin K deficiency. If you've been or you've had a history of antibiotic use, antibiotics, remember, you're knocking out your flora. The antibiotics are not specific to one type of species. They're generally broad spectrum, so they will wipe out large quantities of good, healthy gut bacteria. That's now being shown that just one dose of antibiotics can disrupt your gut flora for up to two years. So if you're ever in that position where you're thinking about an antibiotic or not an antibiotic, here's the question I would encourage you to think about. If your life is in jeopardy, take the antibiotic. If your life is not in jeopardy and the doctor just thinks it might be a bacterial infection, you might just consider waiting uh, and, and, and or getting a second opinion, right? Uh, because antibiotics, can knock out your capacity for vitamin K. Now, if you're on blood thinning medications, particularly the Coumadins, so this would be something like Warfarin or Coumadin, these medications that thin the blood, they actually thin the blood by blocking vitamin K. Okay, so that's how they work. They are direct antagonists to the formation uh, of the way that vitamin K works. Vitamin K actually, uh, there's a process called the decarboxylase process where vitamin K activates a different proteins and it activates your body's ability to clot your bloodstream. And so when you're taking a Coumadin or a Warfarin or one of these anticoagulant medications that are found in that family, you're actually directly blocking how vitamin K does its job. Now, many, many people take these medications and you may be listening and you may be one of them. And if you are, you know, probably your doctor has told you don't eat leafy green vegetables. You're probably, your doctor's probably told you to avoid anything green because they don't want that vitamin K interfering with the drug that they're giving you to thin your blood. If that's the situation that you're in, I would strongly encourage you to get a second opinion, not, not a second opinion as to whether to eat vitamin K with warfarin, but a second opinion as, it, as to whether or not you should be thinning your blood for the rest of your life to reduce your risk of recurring stroke or heart problem. Remember, most people are on these blood thinners because they've either had a heart attack or a stroke, and the doctors have said, we gotta keep you on these blood thinners relatively for the rest of your life or for some extenuated period of time, right, as a result to thin your blood. Now, it's one thing if you've had a life-threatening clot um, and you're on it in the short term and there's like a game plan and an action plan and that doctor is monitoring your clotting time and saying, okay, at a certain point in time, we want to kind of wean you off this medication and, and really work you back toward not needing it. But if you've just been told that you need to be on that blood thinner for the rest of your life, this is why I highly encourage you to get a second opinion because remember we talked about a minute ago the functions of vitamin K and we said that vitamin K deficiency can cause bone loss. It can cause heart disease right? And the very thing that a lot of times when doctors are giving you blood thinners, they're trying to re prevent a heart problem or a vascular problem. Well, not having vitamin K adequately can calcify your arteries. It can calcify the, the different blood vessels in your body and it can make them rigid and stiff. And that will elevate your blood pressure and elevated blood pressure increases your risk for stroke. It increases your risk for heart attack. So if they're trying to reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack by thinning your blood, but by thinning your blood, they're actually causing the deficiency or inhibiting a particular nutrient that actually reduces your risk of heart disease. You have to ask the question, are you getting ahead or are you spinning your wheels in the mud? So that second opinion is important. Remember earlier I wrote on the board, I said there are a number of different things that can naturally thin the blood. So what are those things? 
uh, not warfarin. Warfarin actually was originally created. It was a rat poison, uh, and it was discovered that it that's how it worked. But um, we said earlier that essential fatty acids, so omega-3, particularly omega-3 fatty acids can thin the blood. Magnesium can thin the blood. Um, we said that ginkgo is another one. Ginkgo is another one that can thin the blood. We've got other, and ginkgo is more of a drug-like effect. So really, if we're talking about like natural things that can keep the blood viscosity thinner and inhibit the blood viscosity from being overwhelmingly too thick. Whoa, what about exercise? Exercise can keep the blood viscosity thin. So there are a lot of choices that you have nutritionally. I mean, these are just a few. Uh, and then physically exercise being one of those that in, can improve your circulation, your microcirculation as well. So um, that's, the, that's what I mean by having a second backup plan. It's like, don't be here forever. Like start talking and discussing some of these strategies with your doctor. And if they're not monitoring your blood viscosity, um, and monitor, what I mean by that is there's, there's a couple different tests that commonly get run. One is called PT prothrombin time. Um, and it's a measure of how quickly your blood clots. And then there's a, a calculation that they'll derive called an INR uh, calculation. So these things should be being measured. Uh, and my advice to you is if you've ever been told that, that you, the doctor wants to thin your blood aggressively, and they're not measuring these, then ask. Ask for them to measure those and then ask for some of these things and continue to measure so that you can potentially at some point in your future get off the poison and use vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and diet and exercise and lifestyle change so that your blood viscosity is not too thick. Remember, there's a reason for most people when they have a stroke or a heart attack, there's a reason why, they're, why, they, why that happens. If their blood and if it's happening because their blood is too thick, there's a reason why their blood is too thick, and that reason is generally not because they have a blood thinner deficiency. The reason is because they're doing other things wrong in their diet and lifestyle. Remember, highly inflammatory foods causes an increased viscosity in your blood. Too much sugar can increase the viscosity of your blood, or can make your blood thick and syrupy and sticky. So. You've got to change your diet, change your lifestyle, exercise, eat the right foods to keep the blood viscosity nice and thin. Therefore, if you do that, you won't ever have that need to stay on those uh, for a long period of time or long term. So again, if you've ever been put on those medicines, you need to have that conversation with your doc and get that or get that second opinion. If you've ever been diagnosed with epilepsy, seizure disorder, and you're taking Hydantoin types of medications. Look at your medication. If it ends in T O I N, that's a Hydantoin anti epileptic med medication. But that type of medication also interferes with vitamin K. So if you're on any seizure medication, know that you're inhibiting vitamin K, running the increased risk of heart disease, running the increased risk of bone loss, and running the increased risk of internal bleeding. So we don't like those. If you're taking a type of medication called a bile acid sequestrant. These are these types of medicines are alternatives to statins. If your if your doctor's wanting you to lower your cholesterol, and a lot of people, they'll go in and they'll say, "No, there's no way you're going to get me to take a statin," and so the doctor will pull out a bile acid sequestrant instead. Um, these are different types of, um, again, of cholesterol lowering medications. They lower cholesterol through bile acid sequestering. So they basically bind bile acids. These types of medication, remember what I said up here earlier, if your bile acids are not being properly secreted, or if you are binding them, then you are going to reduce your capacity at absorbing fat. Vitamin K is a fat. So it's important that you understand if you're taking that medication, you're also running the risk of increasing heart disease and bone loss and, and cancers among other things by binding on to those bile acids, you're inhibiting that vitamin K and, and the functions therefore of it. Other things that can um, bind or kind of interfere, we mentioned earlier aspirin, um, we'll, we'll write it down here. Aspirin can interfere with blood clotting. And so again, it's, it's, it's one of those that oftentimes get used as a blood thinning agent, but it's been shown to uh, can interfere with vitamin K as well. And then there's a food additive that used to be more popular in like the, I think it was the late 80s or 90s. You may remember it. It was called Olestra. 
and it was a fat substitute. You remember when everything was going low fat, no fat, and so um, the food chemists were, it was a mad dash to try to create foods that had the, the kind of mouth texture, feel, and taste of fat. And Alestra was one of those, and it was used, and, and it might still be in a number of different processed products. I would look for that because this particular type of agent is known to bind fat. And so it can bind onto that fat and cause you to malabsorb or to not properly absorb fat as well. So if you are eating high doses of Alestra through processed food items, again, you're potentially inhibiting your capacity at uh, absorbing vitamin K. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.